Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. I know it's a big day here in uh, Lambasa. You got all the rugby games being played, so I don't take you for too, I don't keep you for too long. And I wish uh, all the Western teams all the best because I'm from the West. But I wish your team the best. Too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you know that um, we we will be delivering the budget on the 15th of July. And we've been holding consultations throughout Fiji. Uh, yesterday we were in the Tikina of Tawake, and before that we were in Loa Village. Uh, this is the first time we actually had uh, consultations in uh, deep rural areas in Vanuatu. We've done that before. Before our consultations have always been held in Lambasa and Sabu, but never in the rural areas in Vanuatu. We've done that in Viti Levu. And um, the budget, as you know, will be in two weeks' time, so the consultation will come to an end very soon. We have the last one in uh, Suva and Nasinu on Monday, and then one in Ra. And then, of course, we have to deliver the budget. The budget will be delivered in the evening on the 15th of July. If you're Wailesi, you can watch it live. Normally in the budget, the government has to decide what is going to happen in the following year, the next year. But a good government would always make sure that we address not only what's going to happen next year, but what's going to happen in five, ten years' time. We have to plan for the future. And that's what we are precisely doing. In these consultations, we tell you what's happening in the economy, what are the things that people need to understand, and also then we hear from you what are the things that you think that you would like in the budget. What are the things that are important to you? Um, and I'll also do some explanation as to um, how things work, what are the things we need to consider. Uh, we've had obviously COVID. As a result of COVID, our economy became very small. Tourists stopped coming to Fiji, and you can see over here, our economy kept on growing for the past nine years, but because of COVID, our GDP became smaller. It contracted, our economy became smaller. 100,000 Fijians lost their jobs. Over 100,000 Fijians lost their jobs as a result of COVID. We also, government uh, lost uh, revenue. Uh, about $4.6 billion, the uh, economy became smaller by $4.6 million. We lost about $4 billion in foreign exchange. What is foreign exchange? Foreign exchange is the money we use to buy things from overseas. You see this young man here, he's wearing the sunglasses, it's not made in Fiji, it's made overseas. This t-shirt, these shoes, none of this is made in overseas. All the clothes you are wearing is not made in Fiji. It may be sewn in Fiji, but the fabric comes from overseas. Some ladies I see wearing lipstick. The lipstick is made overseas. The tiles are made overseas. This fan is made overseas. All the cars outside are made overseas. The fuel in the cars come from overseas. So when we go to buy these things, you, they don't take Fijian dollars, they take Japanese yen, they take Australian dollars, they take US dollars, they take Kiwi dollars. So you need foreign exchange to be able to buy things. A lot of the medicine, you go to the pharmacy, you go to the hospital, it's all made overseas. The bandages are made overseas. So you need foreign currency. When your economy has lots of foreign currency, then you can trade. When you don't have foreign currency, you can't trade. Tourists, when they come from overseas, they bring foreign currency. You say in South South, they bring Australian dollars, American dollars. When Fiji Airways sells the tickets in Australia, in New Zealand, in USA, in London, wherever, Japan, Hong Kong, foreign currency comes to Fiji. But because the borders were shut down, we could not get foreign currency. All the countries in the world had the same problem. Now, we took some steps, and I'll explain to you what, we, what steps we took to make sure that we still had lots of foreign currency. We came up with some new policies and plans. Government lost revenue overnight, 50%, bang. See, when you go and buy your shirt, you pay VAT. When people stay at the hotel, they pay VAT. When people have businesses, when they pay corporate tax. People in Fiji who earn more than $30,000, they pay tax. But because a lot of people lost their jobs, because a lot of the businesses went slow, 
government revenue went down by 50%. When government makes money, we use that money to build roads, bridges, jetties, tassil roads, fund your schools, all the kids over here, all the young people here going to school, no longer they have to pay school fees. The older people over here would tell you in their time they had to pay school fees. They had to buy their own textbooks. They had to pay their own bus fare. Now you don't. All the teachers' salaries are paid by government, no matter which school they teach at. So that's what you call expenses. And so government revenue went down by half as a result of the border shutting down. But we pumped in $500 million into the economy. We gave unemployment benefit to a lot of people, mainly in Viti Levu. Now you've got the $100 in Vanu Levu. Some people would have applied for that and got the $100. Now, you see the Fijian economy here was growing straight for nine years. Because of COVID, it went into negative. Instead of growing, it went down because of COVID. People stop coming, no business, lockdowns, your lockdowns here, bubbles here, all sorts of things happen. But we are expecting to grow now, this year, by 12.4%. Why? Because over 90% of Fijians are now vaccinated. You remember last year, everybody was saying, oh, what's going to happen with about four or 5,000 people with COVID? The government had a plan, and the plan was, as soon as the word vaccine was mentioned, we started talking to all our overseas partners. Our Prime Minister, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, spoke to Australia, New Zealand, India, and various other countries. We went and spoke to the World Bank and ADB, and we said to them, look, if there's a vaccine, we want it also, quickly. Because every country in the world, as soon as vaccine was made, they wanted the vaccine. So if this is America, America has a population of 300 million people, nearly 300 million people. So you need two doses. That means he goes to the pharmacy, pharmaceutical company and he says, I want 600 million doses. And this is Fiji. Fiji only has 900,000 people. He goes to the ph pharmaceutical company and says, I want 1.8 million doses. Who will get the order? He'll get it because he placed a larger order. So that's why the richer countries, the bigger countries got the orders first. And we knew that would happen. So we pushed and made sure that we got the vaccines first. As a result of that, the Indians gave us 100,000 doses of vaccine for free. Then the Australians, and then the Kiwis, and the Americans, and now the French. And within such a short period of time, Fiji became one of the most highly vaccinated countries in the developing world. In a few months' time, we reached over 90%. What did that mean? It meant we could open up the borders. It meant that not only you were safe and your family was safe, but other people looked at Fiji and they said, hey, this place is a safe place to go to, because those people are vaccinated. So let's not go to that country because it, does, it has very low rate of vaccination. Let's go to Fiji, it's got a high rate of vaccination. That's why we're able to open up the borders. Everybody here that's got vaccinated, you did not pay a single cent for the vaccine. Nobody paid a single cent. We did not pay a single cent, also, as government. Of course, we have to pay for the nurse to go on the horse to go and give somebody vaccine on the boat, in the bus, in the car. But the vaccine itself was free because of the efforts we made. So that's why the economy is going to bounce back here. So over here, you can see, before COVID, you probably can't see that, but nearly 900,000 tourists came to Fiji in 2019. And look at how it dropped. 2020, 2021, we had only 34,000 people last year. So now it's coming back. We're expecting about 450,000 people to come back up. Where are the tourists coming from? Australia, bulk of them. And then the New Zealanders, they've just opened up their border. New Zealand until recently told the citizens, you go overseas, you come back, you have to go into quarantine or home quarantine. Of course, nobody will want to come to Fiji for one week holiday if they go back home and get locked down for two weeks. So now they've relaxed it. So that's why we're getting more Kiwis coming. And then of course the Americans are coming also.
Now, I know everybody is talking about what we call the price of things are going up. And it is going up. So the question you have to ask is why is it going up? There are two types of what we call the price of things going up and down is called inflation. Inflation is what measures the price of things going up or down. So this red line here is what we call imported inflation. The green line here is domestic inflation. I know a lot of people in Banu Liwu grow young orchid. Before Cyclone Winston, the price of Yongona in Suba was $85 a kilo. After Cyclone Winston, $185 a kilo. Why? Because a lot of the Yongona plantations got damaged. But pe people still want to drink Yongona. So less supply, high demand. Less supply, high demand. Same thing, you go to the market before a cyclone, long beans, $2 a bundle. After, After the cyclone, long beans is $5. Because, because low supply, supply, high, supply high, high demand. demand. Sorry, something is happening. So, that's what you call domestic inflation. The other one is important inflation. Everybody here eats roti, purini, babakao, bread. All of those things are made out of flour. What is flour made out of? Flour is made out of wheat. We don't grow wheat in Fiji. Only two companies in Fiji make flour. Punja and Sons in Navutu in Lotoka and Flour Mills of Fiji in Wallupe in Suba. What do, what they, do they do? They buy, they buy the wheat from, from Australia, Australia, they bring, they bring it to Fiji, Fiji, they grind, they grind it, it, put some put vitamins, vitamins in it, and you get flour. 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 Uh, and you get flour. flour. But, but you, you don't, don't go, go to Punja and Sun's factory, you don't go to a family factory to buy flour, you buy it in the supermarket or the shop. So before they sell it to the supermarket or the shop, it's what you call price control. So they'll go to the Fijian Competition and Consumer Commission and they'll say to them, look, 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 we bought our flour, our wheat, sorry, from Australia at $300 a ton, for example. I brought it in, my labor costs, my electricity costs, this is what my cost is. So an FCC will say to them, okay, you can make only this much margin. Then they say to the supermarket. Then the supermarket, they shop and say, or one or new world or whatever. Before they sell it to you, they go to FCC again. Yeah, yeah. And they say, look, I bought it from Punja and Sons at this much. This is my rental cost, my labor cost, electricity cost. They said, you can only sell it to this much. It's price control. Like price on bread is price control. But if tomorrow Australia puts up the price from $300 to $400, obviously the price will go up too. If this gentleman here, for example, he's got to say a shop in the village and he brings tin fish from New Zealand and the New Zealanders are selling to him the tin fish for at five dollars, he's, gonna, he's not going to sell it to you for five dollars, right? He's going to make a margin. He'll sell it to you for say seven dollars a tin, right? He needs to make a profit. But if tomorrow the company is buying the tin fish from, from New Zealand, Zealand puts up their price from five to seven dollars, he's going to sell it to you for seven dollars. He sell it to you for nine dollars. Because he has to make money, otherwise he'll go out of business. That's what's happening. Because of the pandemic, two things happen. The containers, the short supply of containers. Because China was still in lockdown only until recently. And because in lockdown, a lot of the containers were caught there. Our cost of a container before the pandemic from New Zealand to Fiji was five and a half thousand dollars. Today, the same container costs sixteen thousand dollars. Price has gone up. The other thing that happened is that the phones that you have, see this phone. This phone has got a microchip inside it. The microchip is what makes the phone work. The microchip makes the computer work. That microchip is made out from a metal you get from the ground. You know, you dig it up, you get a metal, like like a tin. You get it from the ground. So a lot of the countries are in a lockdown. When there's lockdown, there's not enough metal being uh, uh, produced. 
but people still want the phones. So there's a short supply of microchips. So the price of things will go up. This is what we call supply chain issue. So that's one thing. The other thing, of course, that's caused the price of things to go up is the war in Russia and Ukraine. Russia has invaded Ukraine. The Americans are telling us and telling the rest of the world, don't buy things from Russia because we want to punish them for invading Ukraine. Russia is the la third largest producer of oil, you know, fuel, third largest producer in the world. So there's no more supply from Russia, price of fuel will go up. Ukraine uh, feeds about 400 million people in the, on planet Earth. They grow so much wheat. There's no more wheat exports from Ukraine. Short supply, price will go up. So a lot of people did not understand this. And that's what's actually affecting the price of things to go up. We are being told by the shipping companies that the cost of freight should start coming down by September, October. Because China is opening up, so the cost of the containers will come down. We don't know. Only God knows how long the war will go in, uh, between Russia and Ukraine. We don't know if it's going to spread to other countries, God forbid. If it does, different situation altogether. There's something out of our control. We can't tell them how to, much to sell it to us for. We don't control oil supplies. I wish Fiji had oil, but we don't. I wish we could grow our own wheat, but we don't. But we have Dalo, we have cassava, we have Uto, we have Bele, we have Bhaji, Bindi, Bora, Qatar, all these things are there, the locally grown foods. For most of the, a lot of the countries in the world, the only carbohydrate they have is bread, wheat. But we've got a substitute, Dalo and cassava, Uto, like I said, all the substitutes are there. I'm going to show you a price, uh, a video now. This tells you about what I just mentioned to you about what impact the war is having on the world in Ukraine. Um, it, it, most of it is, is in writing, so you have to quickly read it. I'll start playing the video now. Thanks. Yesterday in USA, 
a loaf of bread cost eight US dollars. Eight US dollars, which is 16 Fijian dollars. That's the impact. So we have to understand this whole happening globally. For us as a government, when we prepare the budget, we have to see what can we do to avert those risks. That's what we think that we have to plan, we have to decide, and what we have to put in place as a policy. Some parts of the world, as I said to you about foreign exchange, and I'll come back to that later, they don't, they've run out of foreign exchange, so they can't buy fuel, they can't buy you know, cooking oil, they can't buy medicine. The foreign exchange is finished, especially a lot of the tourism-based countries. That's why if you see, and I'll show it to you later, a lot of tourism-based countries have, have borrowed a lot more money. But countries like Sri Lanka are having huge problems. And I'll show you the next video, where in that you'll see the guy explaining that they have to set up what we call community kitchens. People don't have jobs, they have to then go out and these people feed them at least one meal a day. And you, the guy, one of the guys will be saying, look, we can't actually give, keep on giving these people food every day. We're going to give them seeds to grow their own vegetables and stuff. I mean, we've already started doing that about two years ago during COVID. We started giving out seeds, etc., in anticipation of what is going to happen. We'll just play the Sri Lankan video, please. Helping put food on the table, community kitchens like this are starting up around Sri Lanka as people struggle with its worst economic crisis in more than 70 years. Food inflation has hit nearly 60% and many people are finding it difficult to cope. Most of these community who are coming today or been coming are surviving with two meals. So we are giving them the responsibility of surviving for one meal and we are saying, right, we will support you with one meal, but a good healthy meal. Few now get to eat this well. It's very difficult. We rarely get food like this. Only my husband is working, but what he earns for a day is not enough to feed the three of us now. Tax cuts three years ago slashed government revenue by more than two billion dollars. The tourism industry was then damaged by the Easter bombings and the pandemic. Now there is no money to import fuel, medicine, cooking gas or food. Right now actually our main focuses are on food banks, on community kitchens and the paying long to medium term uh, community gardens and home gardens because we can give rations but it's very short term. The government is appealing for help. We urgently require the assistance of our friends in the international community to ensure that our immediate needs in terms of the importation of essential medicine, food supply and fuel army. India and China have sent food and medicine in recent days. The opposition says the government has weakened the economy through populist policies and mismanagement. A nationwide campaign dubbed Gota Go Home has been running for two months, calling on the president to resign. The government is seeking a loan package from the International Monetary Fund or IMF. Critics say it will take too long even if agreed and people need action now. Tens of thousands of Sri Lankans are going hungry amid the country's worst economic crisis in decades. Community kitchens like this can only feed a fraction of them. Minel Fernandez, Al Jazeera, Colombo. This is the uh, inflation rate for other countries. Look at the United States. Inflation rate is 8%, over 8%. In Fiji, the inflation rate is 5%. Japan is with the lowest inflation rate, 1.2 percent. European areas, 7.4. Australia is 5.1. New Zealand is higher than us, about 6.9. The United Kingdom is about 9.3 percent. That's how high the inflation rate is. The World Food Organization tracks the pricing of things. Tracking the price of fuel, cereal, wheat, cooking oil, all those things that they have actually tracked. And you can see all of them are increasing. We are going through a particular global crisis at this point in time. The pandemic happened and now of course the Russia-Ukraine war.
what did we do? In the revised budget, we zero rated VET on all those items. All those items, you don't pay VET anymore. If we did not do this, you would have paid 9% more on all those items. Because you no longer pay VET, we lost $165 million government. We collect less VET. But if you look at these items, sugar, of course, uh, we, have, we make in Fiji. Flour from overseas. Most of the rice overseas. A lot of the canned fish comes from overseas. Vegetable cooking oil, everything's from overseas. Potatoes, we don't grow potatoes from overseas. Onions, not grown in Fiji, overseas. Garlic from overseas. Baby milk from overseas. Powdered milk from overseas. Liquid milk, some Fijian liquid milk. Mainly overseas. Dal overseas. Tea overseas. Salt overseas. Most of the soap comes from overseas. Soap powder overseas. Toilet paper, some is made in Fiji. Sanitary pads for women, women overseas. Toothpaste, most of it overseas. Kerosene overseas. Cooking gas overseas. All those essential items that you use on a daily basis, over 90% comes from overseas. So when the price of things go up overseas, it will affect us. Because it comes from overseas, they put in a container, the price of container goes up, the price will go up. So, sorry about that, you can't read from there. But as you said, we've got foreign exchange rate stability. So even though we lost $400 million in foreign exchange because the tourists did not come to Fiji, we still have good level of foreign reserves. How did we do that? The reason we're able to do that is because we knew this would happen. All governments borrow money, right from America, and I'll show you how much debt they have, America, everywhere, Australia, New Zealand, everybody borrows money. The question is, how much do you borrow? And what do you borrow it for? Main question. So what we did, normally we, when we borrow money, we borrow more money from Fijian institutions like FNPF, the banks, insurance companies, they lend to us. And we borrow about 30% plus or minus 5% from overseas. But this time around, we borrowed more from overseas. Why? Because we want to bring in new money. When money comes from overseas, you get foreign exchange. That means your foreign exchange level goes up. When there's new money coming into the banking system, then your banks have lots of money. So when you want to go and borrow money, the interest rate is less. When the economy opens up, the interest rate comes down. So that's what we did. A lot of people don't realize if we did not do that, the Fijian dollar would have been devalued. If it got devalued, it would have been another new problem altogether. We provided, as we said, $500 million in livelihood support. Every single person here in this market at the moment, they don't pay market fees. We paid for them on their behalf to the Lambasa Municipal Council, just to make things easier for them. We also have, for example, last year we started this program where private doctors, if you visited private doctors, we pay your fees for you. We started it off. This year we expanded it. In Lambasa, there's only one doctor who's become part of it, unfortunately. And the uh, doctor in Lambasa, his name is uh, the Singh's Medical Clinic. Dr. Pradeep Singh, Sevilla House, Jaduram Street, Lambasa Town. So if you go to him, you get an injection, you want to do blood test, cholesterol test, kidney test, liver test, you asthmatic, put a nebulizer, all of that you get done, you don't pay a single cent, we pay that to him on your behalf. Why did we do it? It's because of a number of reasons. During COVID, we did not want everybody ending up in the hospital. For, you know, some, she may have COVID, he may go there, he may just have a headache or just a cut. So everybody forms a long queue, he may get COVID from her. Right? So we stopped trying to separate people. We started that. Nobody from Lambasa applied. Or the ones who applied were wanted to charge too much. So that's what we did. So now also, if he goes and sees this doctor, he may have a headache. After the rugby game, he may have a headache, because his team may lose, right? So he may go to the doctor, and the doctor may say, okay, let me check your blood pressure. Let me do a sugar test, a quick sugar test. So he'll say, okay, everything's fine. I think maybe you're dehydrated. One month later, he goes, he has some other problem. The doctor will say, hey, 
Your sugar last time was only four. Now it's six. You're a young man. You better change your lifestyle. Otherwise, you can get diabetes. Your blood pressure is high. Change your lifestyle. So at least what we get, he prevents himself from getting sicker. A lot of people in Fiji, they don't check their health on a regular basis. Because they can't be bothered going to the hospital. So they get a cut. They leave it there for a while. It still doesn't get better. Then they end up in the hospital. Then they'll say, oh, your sugar is 20. You have to chop your toe off. So in this way, you constantly can get yourself checked up. Lambasa, like I said, unfortunately, is one doctor. Please go and see him. Is everything is for free. In, not for the rich people. People like him, they can afford to pay. Other people can't. A lot of people have health insurance. The only Fijians who normally go to the health center or the medical center or would go to the hospital, you can go and see the particular doctor. You don't have to pay. So that's one of the things that we've done. A lot of things like that we provide assistance to, uh, to people. If the fishermen, the fishing license, we, we pay for the fishing license fees. If you're a taxi driver, your taxi license is expiring, you have to pay for it, we pay for that for you. You go and get your birth certificate, we pay that for you. Just to help people not have to take out money each time. So we've removed, for example, ECAL, the departure tax has been reduced. We gave a concessional loan, $200 million. For the f if you get the loan, we pay your interest rate for you for the first two years. You don't do any repayments, only in the third year you start doing the repayments. A lot of people now in Fiji have become debt experts. Everybody says, oh, right? But they don't know what they're talking about. And I'll explain to you what, what happens. I talked to you earlier about debt. When somebody talks to you about debt, there are two things you need to look at about debt. If, for example, government goes and borrows lots of money and puts up on that hill over there one nice big convention centre, and they say that every time a minister comes to Lambasa, he or she can go and have a meeting there. And it costs us $25 million to build it. That's what you call stupid use of money. You should not borrow money to do something like that. If you're borrowing money to connect people to electricity, to connect people to water, if there's unemployment and you're connecting, giving people money for unemployment benefit, that's good use of debt. Right? You're building your productive capacity. If somebody's a fisherman or somebody's a fisherwoman, and she goes and catches fish. If they don't have electricity, they know they have to sell the fish that day. Otherwise, the fish will go bad. But the moment you connect them to electricity, they can keep the fish in the fridge. And then still get a good price for it the next day, or the day after that. So if we're connecting them to electricity, borrowing money, that's good use of debt. The second thing you have to look at is, what is the cost of the debt? If we're going to borrow money, if this gentleman here, for example, he wants to borrow $100,000 and he goes to the bank, the bank says, no problem. $100,000, you pay me back in three years' time, 15% interest rate. He wants to borrow $100,000 too. He goes to another bank. The other bank says, no problem. You pay me back in 30 years, 1% interest rate. Right. If you look at them both, both of them got the same amount of debt. 100,000, 100,000. But who's better off? He's better off. He's got 30 years to pay, only 1% interest rate. He's going to have high blood pressure. Because he has to make enough money every month to do the repayment. His interest rate is 15%. He has to pay the full amount back in three years. He's in relaxed mode. He's got 30 years to pay. And by the time he pays back the money, he's in fact paying far less money because he's going to be spreading it over a long period of time. In the same way, we have borrowed money as a government because all the efforts we made, the Japanese are lending to us at 0.01%. 40 years to pay, 10 year grace period. In fact, by the time we pay back the money we borrowed from them, we're only going to pay 40% of what we borrowed because you're paying over a long period of time. World Bank have lent to us at 0%, service fee of 0.75%. We only pay back about 45% of what we borrowed. It's what you call a grant element. So when people come and talk to you about debt, you have to ask those two questions. Look at New Zealand. 
New Zealand is one of the countries that has very low levels of debt compared to all countries in the world. New Zealand had only 28% debt, debt to GDP ratio. After the pandemic, it's 52% now. Australia, same thing, 42, now it's gone up to 62. Malaysia, Seychelles, these countries are all tourism-based countries. St. Lucia, Seychelles in the Caribbean, Mauritius. Look at the levels of debt, over 100% in Mauritius. Fiji, it jumped from 46% uh, up to 80%. Same boat. I mean, you look at countries like USA, the debt to GDP ratio about 118%, 130, sorry, 130%. Japan is 200, over 200%. Nobody says they are in trouble, only some smart people nowadays want to say Fiji is in trouble regarding debt, without actually understanding. So, you see, the philosophy that government has is that, we, you know, a lot of people before thought that if the pie is this big, and if the people in Lambasa want something, the thinking was, okay, we have to take it from the people in Ba and give it to the people in Lambasa. Because always assume the pie will be the same size. What we are doing, we're trying to grow the pie. We're growing the pie so everybody can get a bigger slice. You don't have to take it from him to give it to him. You don't have to take it from him to give it to him. So you can see, even though the dollar value of our debt was going up, our debt to GDP ratio is coming down. Over here was a Winston rebuild. Cyclone Winston cost us to rebuild $500 million. We spent over $200 million just in fixing up schools. Most of the schools in Fiji are not owned by the Fijian government. The Fijian government only owns about 10 schools in Fiji. Lambasa College, Natambua, QBS, RKS, ACS. All the other schools, you have what? You have the Khalsa school here, Sanatan Dharam, the Muslim League, the Methodist, the Catholic, all owned by those groups. Some of them are village uh, communities, they own it. We don't own it, but when there's a cyclone, it gets damaged, you all expect us to fix it. And we do it. Teachers, quarters, everything, we fix it up. Road washes away, bridge washes away, we build it. So we spend $500 million just to do that. That's why we don't like climate change. That's why we talk internationally. Our Prime Minister goes, recently just come back from the Oceans Conference. That is a huge impact. So that's something, despite that, our economy still grew. Now, the other way of measuring that is what's the dollar value? How much in dollar terms do we owe? Let's look at Bahamas, which is a smaller country but tourism-based country. Bahamas debt is 11.4 billion US dollars, US dollars, which is about 22, 23 billion Fijian dollars. Mauritius, 11.2 billion dollars, again about 22 million Fijian dollars. Fiji's debt is 3.7 billion US dollars, which is about 7, 7.5 billion Fijian dollars. So you can see all the other countries where they stand, the dollar value of the debt. Let me show you the other countries, all the countries in the world. This is in billion dollars, US. This is in trillion dollars. Trillion is the next stage up. USA's debt is 30.5 trillion US dollars, which is about 60 trillion Fijian dollars. Japan's debt is 13 trillion US dollars, which is about 26, uh, million, uh, 26 trillion Fijian dollars. China 12.4, United Kingdom is 3 trillion, India is 2.8 trillion, Australia is 1 trillion, of course all the others are you know, 0 0.1 trillion, etc. So you can see where we sit. We're in a completely different league, they're in a completely different league. But nobody over here says, oh, too much debt over there. Only people in Fiji want to become experts and say, oh, it's too much debt. They don't take into account that we had cyclones. They don't take into account we had a pandemic. Now, this is what I talked to you about earlier on, foreign reserves. You know, like I said, you have to have foreign reserves to be able to buy things from overseas. The International Monetary Fund says you need to have at least three to four months worth of foreign reserves to trade. 
at the moment we have at the moment we have about three tri uh, we have three billion dollars in foreign reserves. We can trade for about eight point uh, eight point two. Is it eight point two? How many months of trade? Eight, I can't see. Eight point two. Eight point two months of trading. So we're in a good space as far as foreign reserves are concerned. I talked to you about liquidity. Liquidity is how much money is in the banking system. Banks don't like the fact that the banks don't say, oh, I've got $3 billion in my account or $100 million. They don't like that. Banks, the way they measure their success is how much money have I lent. Because remember, banks make money from money. Banks make money from money, which is interest. So if I lend to him, I'm getting 12% interest rate. 6% interest rate. So when there's lots of money, so if he wants to put some term deposit in the bank account, if there's a lot of money in the bank, they'll give him only 1%. They'll take his money, they'll pay him 1%, they'll lend to him at 7%. That's what, that's the trade in money. The job is trading in money. So when there's high levels of liquidity, the interest rate comes down. You see, this is the interest rate. Low level of liquidity, interest rate is high. High level of liquidity, interest rate starts coming down. So, you know, like I said, the risks that we have when we plan the budget, there's two things that I'm very worried about. One is climate change. The other one is the Russia-Ukraine war at the moment. We don't know what's going to happen. God willing, the war stops tomorrow, it'll be fantastic for everybody. More wheat supply, more oil supply, the price of fuel will come down. God forbid it expands. If it expands, a bit of a dollar situation. Right? So we have to anticipate that. So we need stability. We need the policies to continue on a stable path. So it's in everyone's interest to protect the recovery we've made. We have to be able to collaborate with each other. We tell this to all the different organizations, our international partners. We're giving a lot of, uh, you know, uh, concessions, we change the laws. Now you want to start a business, you no longer have to get a business license, it's gone. You just start your business, you don't need a business license. Unless, of course, you're going to sell food, like cook food. Then you have to go and get the health inspector to see that you're cooking properly, there's no cockroach in the food, that type of thing, right? So, you know, we've done a lot of changes to make sure that uh, there's a lot of stability. There's, it was interesting, last year, even though we had COVID, we had the highest level of agricultural export. And the three main agricultural exports, apart from sugar, which is obviously different, was kava, yangona, ginger, and turmeric. You know turmeric? Turmeric is healthy. You put in the curry. Because healthy is a, what they call a superfood. You put that the powder, then you put in the milk, you drink it, makes you strong, your joints become good. It's also what we call like a antibiotic, natural antibiotic. So there's a huge demand for that. So those are some of the areas, of course, we'll continue to focus on. We have some challenges, of course. At the moment, there's a huge demand from Australia and New Zealand for skilled labor force. About a month back, they advertised in the newspaper that they wanted to recruit chefs from Fiji. A chef with more than three years experience, they're offering 80 to 120,000 Australian dollars. There's a shortage of people to pick fruits. There's a shortage of people in New Zealand who can work as waiters and waitresses. In, uh, in Melbourne, in Australia, last week, there was, if you went to the public hospital, the waiting time was 24 hours. 24 hours. Why? Shortage of doctors and nurses. A lot of people no longer want to become nurses because they're high rate of COVID, so people are frightened they change their profession. So they might try and steal our nurses. They've already stolen some teachers of ours. There's a shortage of teachers, you know, in math, science, physics. They want them. My brother-in-law works in a, a rural uh, Australian town to do teaching. He's, he's a teacher, high school teacher. Very high levels of allowances they paid. We can't match that. Because that's a rich country. So a lot of people will go. So what will happen to us? If our teachers will go, our nurses will go as a government, we have to say what we're going to do. 
we give more scholarships to nurses, more young people will be trained up. Today in Fiji, 70% of the population is below the age of 40. 70%. 65% of the population is below the age of 35. So all of you over the age of 40 are in the minority. So we have a very young population. When you have a young population, there's a lot of opportunities, there's also a lot of challenges. Young population need to be employed. This young man may be in school, he needs to get a job when he finishes school. When you have a young population, what's going to happen? A lot of babies will be made. Old people don't make babies, young people make babies. So as a government, we have to anticipate what's going to happen. When a lot of babies come along, we have to make sure they also get free education. They also get access to university, they also get access to TELS. They can do vocational training. So when we do the budget, we don't only think about next year, we have to think five, ten years time. We have to plan for the future. That's what a good budget does. You know, when there was an earthquake in Christchurch, and they started re the entire town almost got destroyed. So they started rebuilding Christchurch, they took a lot of our bricklayers, joiners, carpenters, they gave them short-term visas, and now they've got permanent residency. So we have a shortage of people in that area too. So we're working with the Fiji National University to train more and more Fijians in those areas. As you know, the minimum wage has now increased to $4. Every quarter it increases, so from January of next year, it will go up to $4 completely. Now, the reason why um, we've done that, government does not pull a figure out from the air. We bring an expert, he looks at things, he sees what are the economic changes. So if this young man here, assuming he's got a business, Say he's got a, a tire repair shop, right? And he say he employs five people. If we, if he's paying today two dollars seventy cents to his employees, his employees, sorry, his workers, and tomorrow we tell him you pay them now five dollars from tomorrow, you see, it's in, I can't, I can't. Instead of employing five people, I might let go three of them. Please go home. I can make do with two. Then I have to pay you all five dollars. So when this expert comes, he looks at those things. We don't want job losses as a result of wage increases also. So that's why this $4 has been done gradually. By next year, it will go up to $4 January. So for the budget, we want to continue to invest in education, health services, infrastructure development. Some of the things we are planning to do, like some remote areas we want to take electricity because of COVID, economy shrunk, we said, okay, we have to put that on hold. Now the economy is opening up, we can start doing those things again. So, as I said, uh, you know, um, you can give any submissions you wish today, or you can email it to us on that email address, budgetconsultationeconomy.gov.fj. And you can get a lot of information at this web page. We also have a, a lot of, uh, you know, incentives. We allocate $700 million a year just in the education sector. All the schools are getting grants. All the teachers' salaries are being paid. Of course, you've got TELs and TOPPERS. We've now got a scheme with Fiji National University. One of the young men over here want to do a three-week course a two-week course, maybe carpentry, boat building, whatever it is, joinery, we're offering that now through FNU. You've got a new uh, campus here at the moment. So you can do short-term courses, we'll actually pay for that. You can get a livelihood, you can get a skill set. And of course, with the toppers and the tails, that, that continues. Now, this is just to show you unemployment benefit. You know, a lot of people, for example, if they are working in a hotel here, or working at some shop or supermarket, or working in Savo Savo in a hotel, the employees, you know, pay their wages, they also pay the FNPF. So those people during COVID who lost their jobs, we said that they could access the FNPF general account. If the money ran out of the general account, we gave them $225 a fortnight through FNPF. So that amount of money all together came up to $205 million we paid out to these people. Then in Viti Lebu we had the 
two rounds of 50 and the two rounds of 360. And then Vanolevu recently we gave $100, people who applied. Altogether we paid $432 million in unemployment benefit since 2020 up till now. And that's apart from the fact the market vendors and all of those fees that we do pay. Um, this is just something else. So I'd like to now, ladies and gentlemen, just open up the floor. Uh, we want to hear from you if you've got an issue. If you've got any personal issues, sometimes we have people who come to these forums, they may have a land issue or some family matter. You've got staff there at the back, the big table there. You can go and talk to them directly if you've got any issues. And, but we'd like you to raise any issues regarding the budget. So don't hesitate to go to the people at the back. Please feel free to ask any questions, you want to make any suggestions, if you have any questions on the slides that are presented. Don't hesitate to ask and speak in any language, you can, don't have to speak in English, you can speak in the Itauke or Fiji Hindi, whichever language you choose uh, to speak, we've got people who can translate. Okay? Please just put up your hands and somebody will come to you with a mic. Minaka, thank you. And thank you for coming today. Thanks. The Honorable uh, Minister of uh, Economy, Attorney General, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you first, especially for the budget. It is clear now, most of the time we just, uh, some people come and kind of manipulate us and tell us about this and that, and now it's very clear about the government. And uh, only speaking for myself and my community up in Koromakawa, we are not going for good politicians. We are going for a good leader. We are going for good leadership. We is proven from these 14 years. Yes, the 51st has been around for leading the country. And we are so grateful. And we salute the government for that. Thank you so much. And just uh, regarding the infrastructure, our road in Koromakawa, this is also in the budget as well. And we were, managed, we were told that in the mini budget, just the recent one, that the uh, road will be looked after, but yet we're still waiting. We've been, uh, we went to roads authority and the requirements, we, were, they, we all met those, but yet we're still waiting for that. And a big carry for the 40 children from Koromakawa. They have to walk every morning, but for four to five kilometers, wake up at 5.30 in the morning to catch this RSL vehicle at about 7 a.m to go to school and complain from school that fatigue caused them sleeping in classrooms and uh, when I came this morning they shouted from behind this please ask the minister to help us FRA road or is it a no it is no. not a FRA okay. road okay mm -mm. okay and no it's okay please go ahead and uh, secondly sir is it uh, and this road as well serves also these pregnant mothers I have always uh, experience I've seen two mothers given birth on the road before reaching the hospital due to this uh, deteriorated road. It's really bad. And secondly, uh, rural electrification also it's coming on the, I've already explained that, it's just on hold just re because of the pandemic. And we do, please, if you can uh, look onto this matter as well, because uh, our children are still studying under this uh, kerosene and lamp light nowadays. Oh, yes, we managed to buy small solars, Sun King and all this to... Not, no sir. Mm -mm. And also water source for a small community, which is apart from my village, 10 household. We have uh, a small catchment now, but uh, if it is possible to make a bigger one, so, and also to go, there's a road, farm road, we want to make the catchment just beyond that road because when rainy season, the water from this road, from the drainage, covers the whole water catchment, blocks the water. And also regarding for the government, is say that we all have uh, access to clean water. And uh, for my Tiki Nawai Riki, Tiki Nawai Riki, we humbly request if you can have a police post somewhere in Kolotari. Because uh, we in our area, it's a picnic area nowadays, and also drugs has been uh, reported around the areas. It is a possibility to minimize 
and also for a safe place for picnic for the people of Lambasa Vez to come there. And you all know that just previously we have an incident up in Korotari, someone died. If police was there, it would help a bit. That's a character. And another one is uh, regarding agriculture. People up in the Werik area and Korotari, we are all farmers. We are all farmers. And we are in the province of the Kaumrove. And when we come to our office in Lambasa, they direct us to Savu Savu because that is the Kaumrove. It's a humble request. If we can have a, a station somewhere down in Korotari, it will be helpful for us. It's easier for us to come to Lambasa or to Korotari than going down to Savu Savu. And now this is another one for agriculture. This for agriculture. Because nowadays when we look at the prices of goods, nowadays farming will be a good helping hand. But we need someone to there to help us, to direct us, and to empower us what to do in what time. And uh, finally, sir, last but not least, we, uh, dispensary or health center would be helpful for us as well since it's quite far from uh, Lambasa, from the hospital. If a health center is somewhere down in Korotar, it will be helpful for us. It will be, for those mothers I've already explained to, already gave birth on the road, it will be helpful if it's somewhere closer there. And lastly, sir, thank you so much. And affirms me, when you speak in parliament or the Honorable Prime Minister, it says, no one will be left behind. I think, and I do hope and I pray that no one will be left behind soon. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, that list, if you can give it to our staff. Can somebody just come in? Yes, sir. It's already in. You already got it. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It left your phone contact details? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Questions? The gentleman in the back, please. And then we have this young man here.
kawai membeli tirna ngoli puli membeli tenir seberni adui korni puli berna takut sopan dono diwai kotokin en dono wabu na wabu ngo kebakai tau nauda ena luk no wabu berna singin rani dorna wai na korni puli berna ngoli ena lomani koroswin na kere kere ena Nam do ti gona lili ni matan tu kera wani lau rai matan awa pemen baleta non rai bun nang oni ke tu ban tin tin taka na tul na mazawa pida sauti tau tau na uda pera sing lai bun lo mani tu na mazawa sun singa ya tul na singa baleta ti goni taku sawa ti gona wai na awa pemen tel ni wabu a mata ta be kenda se be kem do na lamba sa riba gore lau ti gona ina lo mani tu koro Lau cuma ini naulu niwai ni lembah seriba. Lau cuma isweni na bukuru kisah tu lagi. Gori mata ini kerker. Nai keruan ini kerker na mata tu. Membalai cikgu na kenangan revi cikgu dua na vale niwai. Kenan dua na bengkara bini tempat lau bertolu visa. Kerto na agriculture melain tambe forestry. Merah ningkara bini mami tau doko na be mama ni tiki noweri. Gor naik karuni kere kere, naik katolik kere kere, lau cium mai na korsueni, kena wali wali buta kena itu kor, kena itu. Naga, you already got it? Okay, great. So all these things they've already lodged with our team. We've got more details there, so obviously we'll go and select that. And the gentleman who spoke first uh, hit the nail on the head. Uh, where some of these projects we had planned but have been slowed down. Uh, we have now, as announced in the revised budget, we allocated $5 million for what we call non-FRE roads. You know a lot of roads are now being used like a public road, but it's not actually a FRA road. So we know they're quite important. In fact, some of the non-FRA roads, the buses actually are running there too. So we, we're looking at fixing up those roads. Eventually, we need those roads to become FRA roads. Now, for a road to become an FRA road, the ownership of that road needs to transfer to FRA. Now, then you can start doing all the major things. This, this will be like more of a one-off just to give people accessibility. Like the culverts you're talking about, some of the culverts you're talking about in terms of crossings, we need to do that too because we know a lot of people get connected. But we urge all those people who live around there, the landowners, that eventually you need to transfer that land to FRA. Then we can continuously maintain that. Then, you know, every year you have what you call uh, uh, rehabilitation works, maintenance works built into the budget. Okay. But well, we've taken note of that. Thank you. Uh, there's one thing that I want to mention, because I see a lot of young men and women here. We just announced about two weeks ago that uh, we've started this uh, program which is called Jobs, uh, Jobs for Nature. Jobs for Nature program is where we pay you minimum wage of $4 an hour from January of next year, but you start getting paid from this year, whatever rate it is, I think it's already gone up to about 350 or so. We will give you seedlings and you plant mangroves, you plant trees like the indigenous species, you know, bakua, kawula and all of those things, also breadfruit and other fruits. And we'll pay you the minimum wage. You have to do is to do the planting. But for you to be able to access that, you need to have a registered youth club, a registered women's club. Any club that's registered, you come to us, we've got the forms, you fill that out. We may give you, say, a thousand seedlings. You have, say, 10 people engaged. We'll pay you your wages every week, and you're going to do the planting. You see, in Fiji, at the moment, um, if you want to buy uto, it grows in the wild. There's no uto, uto, sorry, uto plantation. There's no EV plantation. Even things like mandarin, it all grows in the wild. There's no mandarin plantation, no orchard. So we want people to start getting into that area. So we're giving money now. We've got money from the World Bank, 8 million US dollars, which will be spread over three years, about 17 million dollars over three years. So we want to engage a lot of the youth groups and women's groups. And please, if you're a registered club, we'll be advertising that soon, and you can apply for that. 
and we'll, you know, we'll come out after the budget to say how you can do all of that. This part of the plan, we've already announced that. Okay, so keep that in mind. The other one that we've also got is what we call, you know, hemp. You know, you people know it mainly as marijuana. There are different kinds of marijuana or hemp. It's called, generally called Indian hemp. One is the one you smoke and get high, right? There is a chemical in the marijuana called THC, tetrahydrochlorothiazide. That is what gives you the high. Industrial hemp is 1% or less. The higher the percentage, the higher you get. Industrial hemp has 1% or less. Even if you only smoke an entire plantation, you won't get high. But it's, got, it's very fibrous. People make clothes from it, they make rope from it, uh, they even make bricks from it. So we've uh, announced it in the budget. We're currently doing, carrying out some studies. And uh, we just had a discussion two weeks ago with the UN, because we have to ensure that we get the right seeds. And those seeds are not available in Fiji, but we've got good soil conditions to grow it. So they, they told us that we can get the good seeds from Canada. What we want to do is bring the seeds to Fiji, take it to the agriculture school, Fiji National University. They, they can grow all the seeds there, have a lot of seedlings, then we can distribute it to people to then grow it. But we have to make sure that when you grow it, there's somebody to buy it. There's no point growing it if nobody's going to buy it. So we at the moment are sorting all that out. We also have to amend the law because at the moment any kind of hemp is illegal. It does not make a distinction between the ones that you can't get high on and the ones you can get high on. So that's what you're going through. So that's another opportunity uh, you know, for people. We were in law and they said, you know, in our area people actually grow marijuana, the one you smoke. So uh, this is what we can do is a substitute which will be a legal substance. The gentleman over here, please, give me a mic. Certain allowance can be 
if the Ministry of Justice can uh, take out certain allowance for the JPs. Um, the next one is education. Education is very vital and essential. So I am requesting if uh, language such as Ethiopia, Hindi and Urdu advisors be appointed on second men by Ministry of Education in all the divisions. And now also we require the third one. Now we require a lot of counseling and village education to our youth. And for the betterment of the youth to become good leaders of tomorrow, requesting your high office if the scouting advisors be appointed in all the divisions on secondment by Ministry of Education. So thank you very much, sir. Ask two questions. Firstly, how much allowances do you think JP should be paid? Uh, your advisory councils are getting around uh, 150 or so monthly, I think. Uh, I'm not sure. So you should be the same rate as advisory council? No, no, I, even less. If, <laughs> less than that. And so the other, the other thing about the language, what are you saying about the language? Oh, good. like for Pita, uh, okay, uh, Hindi and Urdu language advisors be appointed on second men by Ministry of Education in all the divisions so that they assist uh, the teachers whenever uh, you know advice is needed. They go around from school to school organizing workshops and all that. We want uh, advices because these teachers aren't doing well, or what's the... No, sometimes uh, teachers need advices on these languages, only languages. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, you've got that in writing, can you give it to the staff? Yeah, I will right? email to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's another one, sir. Yes. yes. This sure. regarding Rewa powdered milk and red, red cow milk. So red cow is imported from Australia. Oh, I hope Australia is. All powdered milk is. What about uh, Reva powder? Reva is imported. They just brand it as Reva. Mm. There's no powder. See, to make powdered milk, you have to burn a lot of liquid milk. We don't make even enough liquid milk to supply a liquid milk supplier. It's just a brand. So they buy it in bulk. And then just packet it in Reva. So there's a difference of price there, so that's why I was yeah, just... No, no, they, it's, uh, it's the same, it's all imported. Powdered milk are all imported for in, in Fiji. Okay. It's brand, like butter too. Mm. Reva butter is not actually made in Fiji. They bring bulk butter from New Zealand, mm. they put a lot of salt in it because Fijians love a lot of salt. And they mix it and they brand it as Reva butter. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. You know, we in Fiji, we drink about, we require about 77 million liters of milk a year, liquid milk. At the moment, we're making about 10 million liters of milk we produce. The balance is, of course, important. Okay, uh, people here, one here, please. Uh, so, this is the second time I'm speaking to you. Once I spoken to you in uh, 2018 at Sanganga Primary School, the same issue I'm bringing it to you. This regards to the Nabundi resettlement. Uh, the land was bought uh, for the displaced farmers. And our land has been expired in 1999. Since then, we are not given the lease. And recently, I heard that the uh, stage two has given to FSC. I'm asking you, sir, that land was uh, for the displaced farmers, and uh, we are the displaced farmers. So why not the land is given to displaced farmers, why it is given to FSC? Uh, this is what I am saying, uh, because uh, at the moment, myself, my brother, as 
no land. Uh, a small portion of the land, a piece of land, only 14 acres land, is a hilly land, there is no water, was given in 1999. But the government at the time has promised us that they can give us a bigger piece of land so that we can do the cattle farming there, livestock farming. And that will also contribute to the economy of BG. And also, due to the um, Russian and Ukrainian war, we want land to plant. So my humble request, this is the second time I am explaining you all the files, all the letters has been mm, to the Lambasa Lands uh, Department. And when I raised the question to them, uh, that government, that land is because uh, belongs to the government. So you ask the government whether they will give the land to you people or not the displaced farmer. Say, can that be taken into the consideration, sir? Um, who who moved you there? When were you moved there? 1999. Okay. So, SVT government days? Uh, or children? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They bought the freehold land for the displaced farmers. The government bought the land? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Well, look, I mean, I have to check that. Um, I know a lot of things were done at that point in time politically, as you know. A lot of politics was played then. So we have to check uh, that out. Uh, obviously, you, if you uh, get a lease, you still have to pay for the lease. Yeah, I'm looking for the lease. Not a small portion, about 10 to 15 acres. Because I want to do farming in a large scale. How many of you were moved there? Uh, in 1999, the, about 17 farmers moved to there, to there but uh, it is stage one and stage in three. About more than 1,003 hectares of land is vacant there. Because they were given a small piece of land, they were not able to survive because the water problem and the drought, and when there's a rainy season, heavy rain, so they have moved. So now only myself, my brother, and my father are there. So all of the others? All left. All 67 have left? No, 17 farmers left. 17? 17. 17? Yeah, so left. And sometimes, oh, very small piece of land, we were not able to survive here. So when I asked the land department, the land is vacant there, so they are you do farming, whatever you want to do. From that, we are at, at present we have 150, about 150 sheep, goats and cattle. But when I heard that the piece of land is given to the FSC, I was shocked. Where will we go? In 1999, when we, our house was dismantled there, it was very heartening for us. If that land is given to the FSC, where is our place? That's the question, sir. And when I go to the uh, land department, the government knows about that. So you are the government, so please help us. Okay. Have you left? Please leave your contact. Yes, sir. You've left it with them? Yes, sir. Thank you. Over here, please. <laughs> Minister non da iau ni maten tu, ena buksang ani tiga no eri kau na koro satu lagi, au mai vivere taksang ana kau wai na takan sian dah indai, na mubu mubu na nangon ni buli, ni kima mina lo ni bunua, au manda, memade tanen ni tu ngoli salah sa vida batan na sa boleh ni rau na embak, kena bakau tak kecik onio, kita iu eri kita koro ren ren tahun dua. Tu koron dan dia tahun dua nanti kena erik. Membimbing di tak sok itu perlu nak diwai. Biasa dia, kalau betul nak lima nan rau. Kalau ni tiga tiko, nak bida nak korok itu tiga nak runa itu tak kos ya. Wili nak lawaki, mata lolo, mata kulu kulu kerja bida nanti uten dobu. Jadi kita nak tiga seram melu diwai nak korok satu lagi. Pembawa tu ni saya kau waktu bawa bida nak bos ni tiki na. Tu ni mai ni saya dah pun nama na budget, yo kita ungai ini di muri ya, satu pun ini saya di tu nama ni budget. Itu netu ba netu kawai nang ambet na neru na itu tak kosong, kita tu tak kosong betul na wap. Kita tu sa mungkin tu urana netu mana boleh nang biu tu nang lama ni tiko tiko, biu nak koro, 
mer mai mundo bu ne lomri tigu tigu me vole kai korni buli me sa ni nonro garabi ki na lubi ki ma mer musuko na do sabi den vole ni ndra ne mbaki ni tu kota za ki ni tu watu tu me maleta ni tu wabu ke ni tu ngon sa o gombo ten sangai matai ni min stam be kami ke tu Wana mata kina na shini kua, kua bini bina kawali kua na minista ni labu ni nonda mata ni tu. Kere kere kitu ngai mbau rei to kana bida na koro kitu tiko na ruana ta ta kos. Kitu ta kos of tiu na giwa ime mbale ta ni tu ngoni buli ke ke mami ke ira nda uti te ke mami tiu mai buni wai bina kawali. Okay, thank you. Have you got that? Okay, you got that there. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen here, we've got a t-shirt that says it's a trap. <laughs> centers built uh, that's assessed by national disaster management office they'll come and do an, do an assessment whether there's a requirement or not uh, a lot of the times the schools are actually are used as evacuation centers so you know if someone is really isolated if they think there's a need for that then they'll do that but in terms of the budget we don't specifically have in the budget allocation unless the ministry of youth has a project so what we do is that we provide funding to the Ministry of Youth. And the way we provide funding to Ministry of Youth, they'll come and make submissions to the Ministry of Economy team. They've done some outreach work, etc. They may have a project, they may tie it in with certain things. I mean, one of the ways that we can do it, of course, indirectly, like if the youth club is there, they can engage in these uh, 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 jobs for nature. So you get money from that, then you can use that for the community hall. Thank you. Thank you. That's why we're encouraging the youth, youth uh, groups to uh, engage in jobs for nature because you can kill two birds with one stone. In fact, three birds. Because you'll be able to get the trees growing, you'll be able to get some money, half or some of it can go to your community project, and some of it can go to the people individually, they'll get some income. Okay. okay thank you. Say, I'm just uh, regarding. Uh, the warehouse intensive was given by the government in the budget in 2019. So, I have built one warehouse with all the documentations and other things, but uh, due to a non-consultation by Madhuvata Rural and uh, the changeover was given to the Masa Town Council, and following that bureaucracy, I had paid my license for one year through DO's office and lucky that the government came in with the no business license. Six months I was running around to DO's office and to Lambasa Town Council to get the license, business license. So lucky, say, the government, through so the budget you have removed that. So thanks very much for that. The side of relief was there because I invested about 750000 And uh, to complete that and to have a completion certificate to get my proper lease so I can mortgage that and refinance my whatever I have in put cash for my due this in a very trying time. I couldn't do this till today. I renewed my scheme plan again and they told me the scheme plan expired town council and through that uh, I have uh, faced a lot of problems until today I've been running. So this is this is a state land or Itokia land? Itokia land. Itokia. I've met all the requirements, all the approvals okay. and secondly like talking through the mini budget, the home business was given, we can, the presidential, thank the government of the day for it. And for the lease, like uh, in a mini budget, 
the, for the lease to be from agriculture to any other lease is assisted by the government. It's a separate budget. I really appreciate for that. But uh, I bought one land from my Itoki brother as um, I haven't did farming, cane farming whole of my life. But in 2015, I bought it through running to only TLTB from 2015 to 2020. Then they have showed me the land with the GPS and they entered my name on the computer on the transfer. As soon as I entered the land, they gave me $6,000 areas for the 2005 period to 2020. So when I planted the cane for 160 and harvested last year, first time in my life, still from today I can have a balance sheet here, nothing is coming to me. I have spent all my from my pocket and uh, no, I haven't got any new farmer benefit or any assistance because the delay was there and the, the assistance were in place. But I couldn't get TLTV and the creating a lot of bureaucracies which the government is taking out, but I don't know where it's coming from here and not, it's very well known for that. They're using the system to, you know, track back. HQ is in Suva, we have sent the papers, in blah, blah, blah. Excuse us. So I hope the government to look into this. Lucky I'm a small businessman, I can, I have survived. But a lot of people are there with me. So I'm raising concern on behalf of all, everybody, new farmers who are discouraged, warehouse, like the government gives the incentive, I couldn't reap that benefit because of, I couldn't have the lease, proper lease. So they've been delayed, why it's been delayed? I've been running, I've been writing, I've been emailed to your office, they told me go to TLTV, TLTV. Nobody called and asked our side of the story. Something is told by their staff, they frame this, I don't know, because I, from my experience of life, my hair getting grey, when you delay something, you're speaking about corruption. You want something. That's for sure. And I don't believe in that. Everybody knows I'm very straight speaker, and I don't not support corruption. So I think I've been penalized or victimized for this. There, there I am staying now, as the woman say. Okay. So we have a uh, board member of TLTP. Yes. So please see the mayor yeah. uh, and tell him about your TLT issues, TLTP issues. And give all the details and he'll solve it for you. Yeah, they're doing the double leasing and they're doing a, a double consent, this and plenty issues. Sure. I've been charged by the police, I, went, I was in remand, I went to the court three years and after that police withdraw the case. That's what I'm writing to you. I will just get my uh, rulings, then I'll put it to the Minister of Justice. Okay, sure. But name, please. Thank you. Uh, Minister of Economy and uh, the Attorney General. Just uh, one uh, request regarding our rural electrification. At uh, Numuni Kabula village, which is uh, more than uh, 30 families and two settlements. And uh, till now, since uh, the LA project Lambasa 1205, LAB 1205, and it was uh, first we requested in 2005. And till now, they have uh, paid, uh, just uh, paid the survey and paid. And uh, from EFL, they said that they're waiting for the money from the government to complete the project. And we have a school student there, primary, secondary, and some in tertiary. So we, the humble request is if uh, this uh, project could be uh, included in your this new budget so that uh, the project could be completed. That's uh, our humble request so that uh, the project could be completed regarding so that the, the student could benefit during their study and other, uh, uh, other activities that could benefit them regarding their school uh, activities. That's our humble request. Where, whereabouts exactly is this? Uh, just uh, behind uh, three sisters. It's about uh, 10 kilometers from uh, town. Okay. How far has the electricity gone? <coughs> from the last post, 
to the village is uh, approximately three kilometers. Okay. Okay. Have you put the thing? Oh, not yet. Oh, okay. Please do that. Uh, Kamal, make a note of that. AP 1205, which is uh, uh, Nambuni, Kabula Settlement, Gramaya and uh, Donivau, Lambasa, which is about 38, uh, it is already funded in this uh, revised budget. Uh, the survey, the survey plot being submitted to ESL team and value concerns are being currently uh, undertaken before the project commences, uh, uh, maybe in the next few months. Thank you. Thank you very much. The total cost of the project is 408,237.50. Thank you. So it's about $408,000. For the three kilometers, it will cost us $408,000. I, I just wanted to highlight the cost to you because, as many of you would know, that the reason why a lot of the rural areas in Fiji previously did not get connected to electricity, because the government then required you to contribute 10%. So if you had 40 homes, say in the village, and you want to connect, every home had to contribute. And we found, when we appointed in government, a lot of places, like for example, if this was the entire village, say half gave the money, the other half didn't get the money, give the money. So it never got done. The requirement was everybody had to give the money. So that money, some of the money was sitting there for 10 years, 5 years, 15 years. So we've now removed the requirement. So even though it's going to cost us $408,000, and the way it's done is this. EFL will tell us this is what's the cost. We have to pay EFL. So then they contract the work. Right? So you don't have to pay a single cent. Yesterday we were just saying, because we went to so many parts, you know, we were, I was saying to a lot of people, I wish previous governments had done this. Today we would not have that many places to electrify. You know, even if they'd done like 15, 20 uh, projects a year, it would have had, a lot of people would have electricity. But your uh, program has already, already been allocated funding. So EFL is expecting to start the work in about a couple of months time. We already allocated the funding, $408,000. Okay, thanks. Uh, over here, please. Thank you very much for the budget consultation. Uh, we from uh, Sueni Village, uh, yesterday, uh, we submitted one of the Navi 2 Youth Club uh, grant application. We are asking and requesting only for your approval, sir. Uh, there is a Navi 2 Youth Club from Sweeney Village, Tikino Eriki. We submitted a application for grant yesterday. And yesterday was tell us this, from uh, Navi 2 Youth Club from Sweeney Village. Uh, it, we send it through the Ministry of uh, Youth and Sports. And we are asking on your approval, sir, for the application, so that it can meet our objective. We have the objective for the, for the youth club. Thank you, sir. How the system works. Yes, sir. The way the system works is that because the Ministry of Youth has called for the expression of interest, they are the ones who do the assessment. We give them the money for the project. They'll do the assessment, they'll do the approval or the disapproval. We give them money, they sort that out. I know, sir, they are all under you, <laughs> under the government. Okay, well, I will we'll, we'll make a note of that. Please leave the name of the, you've already got it? Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, there's a gentleman somewhere over here. Oh, yeah. On behalf of <coughs> Lambasa Chamber of Commerce and the people of Lambasa, I would like to welcome to our friendly north and uh, thanking you for giving us to speak on uh, 22 and 23 budget. I must say that this year, sir, I don't have to uh, say anything on the budget because the previous budget you have done, it was excellent and that has helped our business community as well as the people all over Fiji. By reducing over a thousand items, I think it's over a thousand items, duty, two thousand, and um, thirty-two items, uh, no more vet, zero vet, 21. 
Okay, even that has helped our people. Say, as you have mentioned that the prices are going, rising up day by day, just because of the freight and other things. And uh, that nine percent, I think our people are saving, which they can uh, use that money somewhere else. Your government has done a marvelous job, say, the Nambualu Highway. I think we all are enjoying that. And um, there are a lot of things which uh, your government has done, sir. And um, I, for this 22 and uh, 23 budget, I have full faith in you, sir, that this budget will be a budget for people's budget and for everyone in this country and uh, for farmers and for everyone. I wish you all the best for 22 and 23 budget. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. That may be a good note to end this session on. Uh, unless there's any other burning question issue, the one there, please, over here. Uh, this is in the capacity of a couple of things. One is food security, like the Honorable Minister has mentioned. I must thank the farmers, especially the rice farmers over here, who are also the cane farmers. Honorable Minister, this year, this side, with the help of government, there have been threefold increase in rice production. From 700 to 1,700 tons, Fiji rice is buying the rice. And please, farmers, this rice price is fully subsidized by government. World market price of rice fed is around 600. If you are planting rice, you're getting from 700 to 800 dollars a ton. We encourage you to plant rice because of grain price, because of these things are going up. There is a market for you to get it. The minister has talked about the youths planting jackfruits, breadfruits. We are talking with Ministry of Economy through food processes and with your youth groups that we are revamping your Batiri farm. We are looking at to having a processing center has been set up in Lambasa. Now you will see that Batiri is already in the market now. So there is a lot of things that are happening on the Batiri. So your jackfruits, your breadfruits, this we are looking at to export. That also includes your Daruka too. Please so try that, the people in Korotari areas and all that. Finally, to our cane farmers, encourage you to have a sustainable cane production. I think the industry needs about 2.5 million tons of cane. We at Sugar Cane Growers Fund, thank you also to the government honorable minister for all those 600 farmers that they had a tropical cyclone Yasa loan it has been fully paid by government $550,000. So thank you. That's all that we have to do. In addition, there are many subsidies in form that is given to the sugar cane farmers. Binaka, thank you. Um, so thank you once again for taking your time out and being here uh, this morning. And uh, please, uh, as I mentioned, the budget will be announced on the 15th of July. Um, through Wilesi, you can watch it live, those of you Wilesi. If you don't have Wilesi, the set-top box for anybody earning less than $30,000 a year is free. You can get the set-top box. Uh, we put uh, Wilesi um, in uh, for free with TV set in community halls throughout Fiji. If your community hall is there, you don't have one, you can always apply with us and you can get that. But you can watch the uh, budget at uh, around about 7.30, 8 o'clock on the 15th of July. What normally happens when the budget is presented, there is a week's break in parliament, and the following week we debate the budget. And the financial year of the budget starts from 1st of July. Our financial year starts from the, sorry, 1st of August to the 31st of July. That's our financial year. So anything announced in the budget comes into effect, the expenditure comes into effect from the 1st of August. If we announce any duty reduction or duty increase, it becomes effective on the night in which it is announced. Okay? So thank you very much for your contribution. Wish you all the best and may the best teams win this afternoon. Naga, thank you.